guys. So this is a video where I'm gonna talk about my odyssey I went on with my copy of Thomas Brown's Complete Works from 1686. So this book was printed in 1686 and uh, bound around that time at some point. And uh, I got this copy this past year and it was looking pretty rough, honestly. Now it still doesn't look amazing, but it has a new spine now. I got it rebacked. So this spine is from the year 2022. This uh, label is older though. The, the lady who fixed it said that she thinks it might be original from around 1686. It seems like it might be a little after, I'm not sure, because the name is actually misspelled. In 1686, it would have had an E. So I'm not sure, maybe it just didn't fit. But either way, she kept the label. And then this spine is new. So let me flip the book down. And this is the front of the book. So these boards, the front and back boards, are from uh, 1686 or you know around that time so it's a very very old book but uh thomas brown had been dead for about 10 years by that point uh give or take and uh this was the first collection of all of his works where you go from religio medici the pseudodoxica epidemia epidemica whatever it is the uh encyclopedia of uh, vulgar errors then you go to uh, Hydrotaphia or Urn Burial, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit uh, at the end of the video. You have the Garden of Cyrus, and then you have some uh, miscellany tracts. And so, yeah, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the book, show you guys a little bit about it, and then um, I have kind of an addendum at the end of this video. So, yeah, let's just take a look at it here. I'm gonna be really gentle with it because it's, you know, pretty fragile, even though it got completely fixed up. So she had to totally reconnect this uh, front board. It was splitting, but now it's completely solid. So it, it can open very easily. You can see here, there used to be a, maybe an ex libris or something like that, a library, a book, book stamp of some kind that is no longer there. And the paper is very fragile still too, of course, but it's very high quality paper. Like compared to books from today, it's extremely high quality. So this engraving here is from 1686. This is Thomas Brown himself. And as you can see here, the, the front page does have it spelled with no E, so. Perhaps that, that front label is original. You can see there is some damage from uh, maybe some bugs or something like that on the edges, but it's no longer being damaged from that, so I'm not really worried. And yeah, as you can see, 1,500, 600, 50, 80, 6. Printed for Thomas Bassett, Richard Chiswell, Thomas Sawbridge, Charles Mern, and Charles Brome. As you can see, inquiries into vulgar and common errors, Religio Medici, Hydrotaphia, and Garden Cyrus, and then certain miscellany tracts with alphabetical tables. Doctor of Physic, late of Norwich. So I'll just show you, show you some more pages here. And you can see it has the long S. The seventh and last edition, corrected and enlarged by the author with many explanations, additions, alterations throughout. And yeah, this paper still is very, very high quality. I mean, it's, uh, it's thick. And since this is a large book, um, I'll show you guys in a, a couple minutes here what a normal book would look like, the size but this is a large book 
and uh, so this would have been a pretty high quality book at the time as well. Definitely not all books from this time were this high quality. And as you see, to the reader, one nice thing about this is that it does have the, the author's photograph. Sometimes these are ripped out or cut out of these older books. So it is very nice that this one does still have it. And then one thing you can see as well, so ink back in this time had trace iron in it. And as you can see, you might be able to tell it. I know it's not super bright in here, but it's a little reddish. The, the ink has a reddish tint to it. So you can see. Sundry tenants concerning vegetables. What is he writing about? That the mandrakes resembleth the shape of a man. That cinnamon, ginger, cloves, mace are but the parts or fruits of the same tree. That the root gives a shriek upon eradication. So you can see where uh, Harry Potter got that. <laughs> Let's see some others. Uh, that storks will only live in republics and free states. That the flesh of peacocks corrupteth not. Of the glow worm, of worms, that an earwig hath no wings. That flies make that humming noise by their mouths or wings. <laughs> that snakes sting with many others. So as you can see this, if you haven't read this before, oh, there's a really funny one up here. That elephants, that an elephant hath no joints. <laughs> so this is a book about uh, common, like silly ideas people have and why they're wrong or why people believe them. So I'll just uh, leave it on here for a second while I, I talk about Thomas Brown a little bit. So I've been reading Thomas Brown's works for six years now, give or take. I first heard about him from, I can't remember who it was first, but it was either Herman Melville or Virginia Woolf. Because so I remember Virginia Woolf basically says something like, uh, you know, every, every good reader likes Thomas Brown. He's the, you know, salt of the earth or something like that. She says some phrase and then, Herman Melville refers to him as a cracked archangel, which is an excellent description. And then the first book I had that had his works was the NYRB, where it has, um, I believe it has Religio Medici and then Urn Burial. I can't remember if it has Garden of Cyrus. But um, I distinctly remember reading Religio Medici for the first time, and it is nuts. It is crazy to, to think that it was published in the 1640s because uh, the reason he wrote it was because doctors at the time were considered generally to be atheistic. And so it's basically an apology or a defense of doctor's religion. So the religion of the doctor is him explaining his view of religion, which in the end is very idiosyncratic. and one particular part of that book that stood out so much to me is he was talking about the Americas and he was thinking, okay, well, there are people in the Americas. We know that humans, whatever. Okay. How do they not have horses? How do they not have the most useful animal? How did that happen? And he basically just leaves it as a question, but that almost starts getting you think about migration patterns and evolution and extinct, uh, humanity extincting animals and things. So this would have been the 1640s. So very, very forward thinking. And then the book I'm gonna talk about for the majority of this video, which hopefully won't be too much longer, but will be uh, 
hydrotaphia or urn burial. So before I get to that, I'm going to close up this old edition here that is um, about 100 years older than the United States, the country that I live in. And so let's close this up, try to keep it nice, preserve it for future generations like past generations have done for me, though it is in somewhat rough shape. Still, still preserved though, new, new back on it, which is not cheap, but definitely worth it. So that being said, if you want to learn more about Thomas Brown and you want kind of like a, you know, a really thorough academic overview, Reed Barber has a, a biography, Sir Thomas Brown, published by Oxford. Highly, highly recommended. If you've read his works and you want to go more in depth about what his life was like, definitely get this. And then if you want my opinion of the best edition of his works, I would recommend this Oxford, uh, 21st century Oxford authors, Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown did, uh, you know, he was a doctor and he did go to Oxford University for a part of his medical degree. And then he went over to the continent, ended up getting his actual doctoral degree from Leiden, which was famous for its medical program, anatomical studies, things like that. So get this edition because it has the original spelling, which in my opinion is vital for these early authors to truly understand how they thought and how, how they spoke their language. But I want to focus on hydrotapia or urn burial because the story behind that is in Norwich, which is where Thomas Brown lived. You saw it on the front piece here. Thomas Brown of Norwich. So that's where he practiced medicine and that's where he lived the uh, majority of his life. And um, in the 1650s, you know, right, right around the time of the English Civil War, which Thomas Brown lived through, they dug up a Roman urn with ashes in it. And that caused him to ruminate and uh, discourse on burial practices and, you know, death, to put it bluntly. And he wrote this essay that is about 40, 50 pages in this edition. It's not, not very long, called Hydrotaphia or Urn Burial. And it starts with that discovery of that urn and then Thomas Brown was one of these guys that just loved learning about everything. And I think that's one way that I can relate to him in some sense, where, you know, he references so many things. He references Egypt, Persia, China, India, of course, classical antiquity, Greeks and Romans. He references um, Germanic history, Charlemagne, Anglo-Saxon all the way up to his present day, which at this time would have been the 1650s, mid, mid 1650s. And um, in doing so, he talks about the differences between burial practices and he mostly focuses on uh, internment, so inhumation to bury, and then uh, cremation because of the the urn of course but then at his time it was more common to to be buried and he talks about this he thinks about the passage of time and there is one particular passage that I want to highlight but in doing so I want to draw attention to the fact that Javier Marias passed away only a few days ago uh, you know at the age of 70 and Javier Marias translated Thomas Brown into Spanish. And he translated this exact passage into Spanish that I'm about to read. And then I want to talk a little bit about Marias before I end my video. So you have a section here, which I'm not sure how easy it'll be to see, but this is from part five of Hydrotaphia or Urn Burial. Circles and right lines limit and close all bodies. 
and the mortal right line circle must conclude and shut up all. There is no antidote against the opium of time, which temporally considereth all things. Our fathers find their graves in our short memories and sadly tell us how we may be buried in our survivors. Gravestones tell truth scarce 40 years. Generations pass while some trees stand and old families last not three oaks. To be read by bare inscriptions like many in uh, Gruter, it's hard to see when I'm reading through my phone, to hope for eternity by enigmatical epithets or first letters of our names, to be studied by antiquaries who we were and have new names given us like many of mummies, are cold consolations unto the students of perpetuity, even by everlasting languages. But with that being said, there is some consolation, I think, perhaps cold as well, but that the fact that this book was printed in 1686 and it still exists, it's still being cared for. And that really in the end is, I think, one of the reasons why I read and why I love literature and I love history and I love art and the sciences and mathematics and people in general is to try to keep it keep it going as much as I can, keep civilization alive in some small degree to the next generation, you know, because people have been humane and generous and kind enough to keep it going for me. So the least I can do is to make sure that little two-year-olds who are, you know, squirming around on the ground and just learning language still have Thomas Brown to look forward to when they grow up and find out about him. And with that being said, I want to touch on the connection between two writers, two Spanish writers, Aliocha Cole and Javier Marias. So Marias just passed away only a couple days ago, and Aliocha Cole died in 1990. And they were very good friends, very good writer f friends, but also just good friends in general. And back in 1990, Javier Marias wrote somewhat of an obituary for his friend who had died of suicide only days before. So I just wanted to read out a little passage that um, Javier Marias wrote out. So in the dedication, uh, in his personal dedication that he wrote to Javier Marias in the book Vitam Venturi Seculi, which translates to something like uh, and the life everlasting, or life everlasting. Alio Chacol wrote, Para Javier, mi amigo y mi compañero errante de palabras, de silencios y de siglos. And then Javier Marias writes a continuation, Por los siglos venideros, and for centuries to come. So with that being said, I think that, you know, when you see these three books lined out, you have a book still around from 1686, written by someone who's long past. You have the, the masterpiece by Eliotra Cole, writer who's not very well known, but is definitely gonna be surviving into the next centuries. And then Javier Marias undoubtedly will survive as well. And I wanted to touch on another writer that helped me uh, read more deeply into Thomas Brown, W.G. Sebald, who wrote a book called The Rings of Saturn. I have a really long video about the connection and just kind of discursive thoughts on W.G. Sebald and Thomas Brown called The Rings of Saturn, if you wanna check it out. I might link it in this video, but anyway, I just wanted to share my thoughts on my new book as like a, an artifact of bibliophilia. <laughs> and then considering the fact that one of our, one of our best writers just passed away, I couldn't help but mention him because he translated such a a world-class writer like Thomas Brown and one of his friends. 
So anyway, hopefully you enjoyed. Death is a gang boss.